So, um, first of all, let me clear up a little point. Uh, when we talk about biodiversity, people often think of species richness, the number of species, and that's a uh, gross misunderstanding. What species richness is, is actually complexity. It's a measure of complexity and succession. And what it measures is the number of potential linkages or processing chains that species, how that species interact in. So this is an important issue because of um, something that came out in, uh, in July before the big IPCC uh, report came out, there was a smaller report called the IPBES and IPCC, Biodiversity and Climate Change Report. And the IPBES is the in Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And they met for the first time in about 20 years with the Intergovernmental Platform on Climate Change. Um, and their statement boils down to this, you cannot solve uh, climate change unless you also solve biodiversity, because the destruction of biodiversity is a destruction of the processing systems that sustain this planet. And it's an acknowledgement uh, that the planet is a living organism. It, uh, we depend on its processes to maintain life. So when we consider old growth forests, we have to consider forest, first of all, as a superorganism that organizes the big word, biological, geological, and processes that are essential to life on this planet. And there's just a few points that I have to clarify for you or familiarize you with, and that's, uh, biological processes and chemistry, a little bit of cell, uh, cell uh, physiology. And then I have to talk about humic acids and what they do in points of climate research. So a good starting point is why 21 centigrade matters. This comes in two sets. There's an article that came out last uh, month, it's the 24th of September, on the significance of organic aerosol driven climate feedback in the boreal areas. And what it uh, studied in Finland is the aerosols, the effect of the aerosols that come off the forest. Why 21 centigrade matters goes back to research that was done around 2003 by Ian Woodward, University of Sheffield. And what he demonstrated was that all plants, whether they be in uh, Africa or in Antarctica, thermoregulate. They regulate their immediate environment to 21 degrees centigrade because that is the optimal uh, temperature for photosynthesis. That leads to uh, large changes in how we view forests and atmospheric uh, processes. It leads to what um, Doug Keel calls the new biology of global water cycle. And this is the theory of uh, uh, that has been largely developed by uh, Gorshkov and <laughs> somehow, okay, here we are. Viktor Gorshkov and Anastasia Makarieva, and it's called The Forest is a Biotic Pump. So when you go back to that question of the aerosols, uh, trees put out aerosols that form uh, cloud-forming nucleus. In other words, rain particle. Uh, and they create, they regulate cloud production. But more importantly, if you follow a biotic model, that release of aerosols creates a low pressure system and draws in water. And it draws it not just in the immediate watershed, but to the next watershed. So one of the questions in managing forests has to be what is the effect of one watershed impact to another watershed impact? It complicates matter, but the idea is that as forests are 
develop, they actually drive what we call flying rivers. So if you deforest um, parts of Europe and all of Siberia, China would lose 80% of its rain. In North America, the same thing applies to what happens if you deforest um, the coast, the Pacific coast, to the extent that we have in DC. Well, that has an impact on the transference of water across the prairies to the north, to the boreal. And that means drying up uh, the prairies, and it means drying up uh, the east and the boreals. So this is the system of uh, flying rivers as it exists. The implication, I see I'm gonna have fun here. Uh, the implications of this come out in what we might call uh, standard limnological studies. Uh, there is a study that came out uh, in 2000, in I think a couple of years ago in Corvallis, and it studied uh, the ALSI watershed and what happened with clear cutting. And it's best to turn to this one. Uh, the work was done by Catalina uh, Segura at University of Portland of uh, Oregon. And it's the long-term effects of forest harvesting on summer low flow deficits on the coast. And what she came up with is even in recovering forests that are 40 year old plantations, the stream flow was 50% less. In other words, it's the loss of 50% of the water. That was in comparison to 110 year old for recovering forests. Now there is no comparison to forests such as we have at Ferry Creek, which for reasons I'll explain in a moment, are probably over 6,000 years old. So you find yourself suddenly with just in terms of water volume, a loss of at least 50% to what was there traditionally. Uh, this is hard science, so you don't, there's no way to argue with these facts. We lose the water. We also lose the water to our coastal systems and we lose it across the continent. Okay, now why lichens matter in our whole thing? Well, lichens are important to understand the age of forests. There's uh, the 2019 McMullen Wersma paper that came out, out with old growth, in with ecological continuity. Uh, we can age a forest more easily and more accurately by knowing its lichen composition. So why is this important? Well, in part, from a technical point of view, back in 1973, Dennison uh, published this article in Scientific American and other, uh, had other studies, of course, went with it. We studied the role of, uh, the, of throughfall water chemistry in the hydrological cycle. So to sum up what happens, most of the water we have comes in at about uh, four, a pH of four, like vinegar. And it goes through the canopy and comes out at the bottom of the tree at about five, pH five, then goes through the soil and comes out circumneutral around seven. Large part of those changes are driven by lichens and bryophytes. What Dennison studied was uh, what was the impact of lobaria, that lungwort lichens that you see on, uh, on the nitrogen regime. And he came out with the figure that in an old growth forest, um, lichens, lobarias alone, and this is only one species of lichen, a, do a dominant species, nevertheless only one, produce 10 to 44 pounds of uh, per acre of nitrogen, which is like heavily fertilizing a farm for corn. So, In, in practical terms, lichens and bryophytes make up as biomass only 7% of global carbon. However, in terms of terrestrial biological nitrogen, 
they produce 50% of the nitrogen that powers all our forests, all, all of our environment, and 25% of marine biological nitrogen. Now, when you look at the biological nitrogen, that 25% accounts for all of the oceans, every part of the oceans. That's a, an average. But when it comes to coastal waters, 85% of the nitrogen in coastal waters, in the kelp, in the productive kelp areas, which are essential to sustain fish like Chinook, uh, comes from the lichens, the lichens and the bryophytes. So these are small things that are actually quite important. And the importance of that was brought out in uh, 1999 by I.K. Uh, Matsunuga in the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. And it was the word uh, called the role of terrestrial humic substances on the shift of kelp community to crustose coralline algae community in the southern Hokkaido island of Japan. Uh, when his problem was this, when a, uh, an ocean floor is taken over by coral and algae, it displaces kelp and turns it into a virtual desert. And what he found was it was forest derived humic substances inhibit crustose coral and algal spore germination and allow kelp to come back. So if you want to bring back kelp, his argument was you got to rebuild your forests because the forests produce the humic substances. Why are humic substances important? Well, they're important because they're fairly stable chemically and they can be reused several times, but there's a simple principle. You cannot uh, have photosynthesis without humic substances because photosynthesis depends on a very small molecule of iron in the middle of the uh, of, uh, of your uh, cell. The only way that you can get the iron into a chloroplast is with humic substances. They are the biological carriers. So the concentration of humic substances that go out to the ocean is proportional to the productivity of the ocean. And that was uh, Matsunuga's claim. And the proof of that uh, was actually, has been repeated else in many places, but work by Kreis uh, Crackler in uh, sphagnum dominated bog systems, in Northern Scotland, um, produced the following data. Creeks that run through modified peatlands, those are um, uh, drained peatlands, 11 to 15 micrograms of iron per liter of creek water, whereas creeks that run through intact peatlands delivered 370 to 470 milligrams of iron per liter to seawater. And that's a ratio of three to one or 3% return if you ditch and put roads through your forests and your slack bogs. So the question you have to ask yourself is when you make, have these impacts, can you expect to run an ecosystem? And my uh, argument would be, no, you're depleting it and you're going to drive it down. Now, in terms of um, what happens to a forest before uh, as old growth forest cut and recovery, those studies started out in uh, Hubbard Stream experiment run by the Yale Forestry School since 1954. Uh, various places uh, imitated this. So we have Carnation Creek studies that have also uh, carried out similar experiments, but not with the length of data. This, uh, this is unusual. We have at least uh, about nearly 70 years of data from Hubbard Brook, reliable data. So, Deforestation is actually a form of um, irreparable harm. And what we know it causes is soil subsidence that um, uh, Susan Samard talks about quite a lot, the loss of carbon on the carbon floor. 
We also have a flush of essential nutrients, iron, magnesium, phosphate, calcium, et cetera. We have a loss of bacterial processing and my, my, uh, mycorrhizal connectivity, but we also have lichen collapse. So suddenly you're taking an old growth forest, which has evolved um, in a lichen dependent environment, and it's replaced by nitrogen fi fixers. These are essentially weeds, red alders and um, Scott's broom. If you want to find weeds, go out to, to uh, a clear cut. It's the ideal place for them. They are fix performing an essential role. They are fixing nitrogen and they're part of the recovery. Now, one of the central assumptions in before and after studies is that water travels on subsurface. However, when you look at the extreme rain events we have, suddenly you have those, uh, the subsurface uh, assumption no longer works. So you have massive erosion to contend with. Now, how long does recovery afforestation take? That depends on, uh, on the site and the structure. So uh, normal, the literature will give you the following spans. Things can recover in 20 to 125 years biogeochemically. Uh, generally, more closer to 60 or more. But at that point, uh, if it's a forestry area, we're going into rotation. So there is actually no total recovery. And sites and uh, it depends on site and spe uh, species specific return. Does biodiversity return? That's a central question in this sense. Uh, a for, an old oak forest is not a grown up young forest. Forests, as they age, metamorphosize. They turn into different compositions, different structures, and they draw special species, generally for a reason. This is a, a picture on my right hand side of uh, Pseudocephalaria. Speckle, the old world speckle, speckled belly. And uh, Tasha, who will not be here, wanted me to tell you that apparently a further 19 trees have been, uh, bearing trees have been removed of the 60 or so she found. So what it, if this lichen is special because Trevor Goward, who's a specialist in this, estimates that you really only get Pseudocephalaria, once a tree uh, forest reaches the, age, the venerable age of about 6,000 years. So that forest sudden uh, has a companion, which is this, the uh, speckled, old growth speckled belly. And as you can see, it's very blue. It's a blue green lichen because it's a heavy, a high produ production of nitrogen to sustain an old growth forest. So that's all part of the the changes that a forest undergoes. So without further ado, I think that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mangon. Um, I will now introduce our next speaker, Jim Cuthbert. So if you can just stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Mangon. And then just mute yourself. We will get over to our next speaker. Great. And Jim Cuthbert will speak to a few pictures that I will share here. Uh, in addition to his credentials that we saw at the beginning, Jim Cuthbert was a former director of the Western Canada Wilderness Committee and former vice president of the Association of Professional Biologists of BC. And he will speak to some pictures here. Here we are. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Kendra, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm hoping that this will be the second of several presentations of this format coming up in the months ahead. And we appreciate your support. And also would put the offer to you tonight that if you're wishing to support our work in terms of scientists, as well as citizen scientists recording information about not only the Fairy Creek old growth forest, but the old growth forest in the adjacent valleys as well. There are opportunities to do that. I'd like to speak to you mostly about um, what we found in terms of uh, direct field work 
These are field trips into the old growth forests that have been identified, located, documented, not only in the Ferry Creek watershed, but in a number of watersheds adjacent to both east, west, north, but not to the south, towards the San Juan. Found an incredible diversity of life and, of course, amazing old growth forest. It's just incredibly beautiful, incredibly inspiring, and obviously, from our opinion, in need of protection. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we go out. I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time in the field as recently as yesterday. And while I have a lot of photographs, tonight's uh, presentation will be quite limited. Um, John, who will be speaking after I, um, will have more photographs of uh, the ones that I too hope to present in future presentations. Uh, there's an issue with regard to storage on my cell phone and that's for prohibiting me from um, putting some of the images up that I would have intended to. So I apologize for that. I'm going to um, begin by mentioning that the old growth forest stands in the Port Renfrew area are fairly numerous, but they're quickly um, disappearing with the logging activity that's going on, even as I speak these, these weeks. Uh, recently have uh, saw, uh, witnessed the starting up again of active logging and some of the logging is um, directed at trees similar to the one similar to the ones you see on the screen. This particular tree is very close to one of the protest camps out in that area called R and R. And it happens to be very close to one of the rivers as well that uh, drains that area. And it's not unlike many of the trees that you can find um, with a bit of searching. Some of them are, are very easy to uh, locate, just a very short hike from a road. Supporting um, the species diversity in this area are trees like this, but a quite a variety of other uh, plant growth, a tremendous variety of uh, diversity that's hard to fathom. It's so incredibly diverse and uh, awe-inspiring. What I'd like to do is touch on some of the species that um, would be supported and are supported in an environment like that, that occur in low numbers elsewhere. So having them here is special because it is a habitat that's supporting the habitat requirements for the sustenance of these species. I'd like to list a couple while we have limited time. Um, I will just mention ones that I think will pique your interest. These um, species are all referred to as vulnerable in the sense that they're of concern because of low numbers and also low uh, habitat availability. Some you might know, uh, some you might not. I'll start off with some of the raptors. Northern goshawk is a um, species that relies on the old growth forests that we're studying and documenting. There's a particular subspecies that um, calls this area home, and we're doing our best to locate some active nests that were identified about three years ago. So there is some protection of part of the mountainsides out there in the form of a wildlife management area, and we're hoping that um, that will be expanded in terms of protection because with the logging that has been taking place and is currently planned to take place, um, there is a loss of habitat, including the loss of the trees that these birds, the northern goshawk, rely on for, for the sustenance, for them to survive from year to year. But the good news is that there has been some protective um, steps ma made. And in one uh, case, there's quite a vast uh, area of the west side of a mountain that's been set aside as a wildlife management area, particularly because it's found to be suitable for nesting habitat for the northern goshawk. Another one that's an iconic species that we have seen in the Ferry Creek area is the peregrine falcon. And I'm pleased to report that the activity that has been observed of the peregrine falcon includes nesting activities with the flight patterns, um, with flight activity timing being active in the morning and later just before nightfall, all indicating that there's a likelihood of a successful nesting activity and a season going on. So we'll keep our eyes peeled. No active nest has been found but the activity indicates that such a nest exists. Also, the Western screech owl, uh, you'll be hearing more about that later, a very special bird that um, has uh, a lot of keen followers around the world, I'm sure, and uh, you'll hear more about that as, uh, as I'm sure um, as the night unfolds. Some of the other species that have been identified as either endangered, rare, um, species of concern would include the yellow rump chat. And again, just quickly, I apologize for not having these photographs, but they will be coming at a follow-up presentation. 
Um, also, I'll mention bantail pigeon. Those are ones that are fairly easy to see in places. Uh, for example, the Kaikus area is an area of log, logging that's not too far from the Ferry Creek area near Port Renfrew. And it uh, has been the site of several sightings of the bantail pigeon. The red-legged frog, moving on to amphibians, again, um, a species of concern that needs protection. And of course, it's vulnerable in that um, they have uh, a very um, easy uh, access by people, predators, uh, because they're very um, slow moving. And also in the area of some of the, the major um, development areas in terms of supporting people that are out there uh, defending the old growth forest, uh, toads are often seen as well, or frequently seen, and some of them are very large. Uh, one very special sighting that was documented on film that's still investigated, being investigated is um, a series of short clips of a giant salamander up against some boars. And the videos are clear, uh, but the process of identifying what the species is, is still underway. So I hope to have an update on that uh, when we have our next presentation. Another uh, species that we identified in one of our several field trips where we've had scientists and citizen scientists come together out in the Ferry Creek area and take trips into accessible forest land would include what could have been a tail um, dropper slug. You'll hear more about that, I'm hoping, later on. Uh, moving back to some of the birds that are iconic, the marble murrelet has shown to be um, abundant in a number of locations. One of them is close to a site called Heli Camp, and that's one of the forest defenders camps, protest camps. And at that site, um, there's been numerous repetitive sightings of the birds early in the morning, as well as later in the evening. And also recordings, not only visually on videotape, but also uh, audio recordings confirming that these birds are coming in from the ocean where they spend most of their, their time foraging for, for food, including small fish, and bringing those um, fish and other food sources back by flying from the ocean into these inland site, sites uh, where they rely on the horizontal branches of the old growth forest as nesting platforms. A number of the trees that uh, were identified earlier uh, as nest sites unfortunately have come down recently. Going on, um, there was reference to the speckled belly lichen. The only thing I would add uh, is the issue which is uh, to be known, it, it has to be dealt with, and that is that the um, abundance of the speckled belly lichen where it's in its largest numbers happen to, happens to coincide with an approved active um, cut block. So the uh, mention of, I believe, 19 of the 60 trees where it's been found having been logged it is troubling to say the least. We also have um, just recently identified what appears to be an equivalent tree to the old Lonely Dug or Big Lonely Dug, which is an iconic tree that people travel great distances to see. And that's not far from one of the other protest camps called Eden. Beyond Eden Camp, one takes a large bridge over the Gordon River and then an upslope to a place called Eden Grove, which just is an amazing spectacle of old growth trees, many of them quite close to each other. And that's why the term Eden Grove is most applicable. The uh, other tree will be um, searched out tomorrow during an expedition uh, where a team of three will be driving and then hiking in trying to document this enormous tree that is so large, you can't help but be totally impressed and amazed by it. And again, um, I understand that there's an active uh, application for um, logging a small area in the, the very site, the very area that this tree was identified. So there's concern that it, it could be lost. I also mentioned um, with regard to uh, Lewis's comments about some of the early research sites, citing um, sites that were providing long-term documentation of our, our uh, ecosystem activity, he mentioned Carnation Creek. And uh, it was great to hear him say that because uh, well, a long time ago when I was at university, it used to be a site that we visited on a fairly regular basis to try and uh, help document the uh, detailed knowledge of the ecosystem and how an operating salmon spawning system worked and was productive from year to year. I think what I'll do is possibly just bring a couple of slides up now, if we can do that, and a brief comment on them as I finish my time. I've mentioned uh, this particular tree, if anyone's uh, heading out towards Ferry Creek, uh, you can get to it by just heading to the camp that's referred to as R&R, &R, and you'll see it just before you get to the camp. 
didn't necessarily have to have them on the screen. That's fine. This is a somewhat of a, an aside to the, tonight's um, agenda item, but there was a reference in Lewis's comments about uh, massive erosion. And I had some photographs that were taken um, approximately 24 hours ago on um, the site of a very recent clear cut just before you get to one of the main um, intersections as you're traveling up Gordon Main. It's called the Braden Main intersection with Gordon Main. And there the recent clear cut is um, of concern to many people because one example is that um, an example of the massive erosion that was referred to a few minutes ago, uh, much of the road system that provides access for the loggers to take the trees down on this clear cut has been lost. And that the reason it's been lost is that uh, it hasn't been built properly, culverts were not put in properly. And this represents a long-term loss. It'll be generations in the future before this land gets back. So we have lots of um, issues to deal with and um, there's no, no lack of um, the uh, ecosystem's ability to return these areas to beautiful natural flourishing areas, but it, it does take hard conservation work and that's what we're all aiming to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and Jim, if you could mute yourself and we'll go on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is John Nielsen. And in addition to his credentials mentioned at the beginning of this show, he is involved with COSEWIC, Canada's National Committee Dealing with Species at Risk. He is also involved with uh, fisheries consultancies whose clients include the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas and the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. He will now talk about the iNaturalist work that he has been involved with and the documentation of 329 different species, 16 of which are considered vulnerable. Welcome, John. So thanks, thanks uh, for joining us uh, this, this evening, folks. And I want to take you for a virtual walk in the woods. And I should mention that I'm speaking to you from the uh, unceded territory of the Comox First Nation uh, in lovely Comox. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this information we've gathered from working in the traditional lands of the Apache First Nations. So let's get started. So everyone has a lot that brings uh, different reasons for being interested in the, uh, the old growth uh, logging uh, controversy. And for myself, um, I, as you can tell from the introduction, I was a fishery scientist. So I'm kind of uh, out of my comfort zone here. But from being involved with COSIWIG from 2016 to 2019, which is uh, Canada's national body dealing with the assessment of species at risk, I heard assessments of many species from uh, the biodiverse and productive old growth forests of BC, and particularly the valley floors. And these were often uh, uh, studies of lichens and mosses. And with that sort of context, it drew my attention to the controversy surrounding Ferry Creek, which is, as being pointed out, is one of the last uh, relatively intact watersheds in southern Vancouver Island outside of the, the parks which are currently found there. So on the top right, you can see uh, a picture of that uh, watershed which we're referring to. And for those of you that uh, haven't been there, I can certainly recommend visiting it. It is truly a spectacular place and uh, it is uh, very lovely. So as further context, we can he we've heard from many sources now that old growth forests are being cut at an unsustainable rate. And the graphics which are shown on the right hand side are from the ancient forest alliance. And we can see the picture uh, in 2012, shown the bottom right, compared with the historic uh, view of what old growth uh, distribution is like on Vancouver Island. So that was 2012. And since then, we know there's even less old growth remaining. And we know there's uh, supposed to be a report from the old growth panel, which uh, the BC government has set up, which should update this picture. Uh, but I don't expect it's going to look 
any better. So as I heard from about Ferry Creek and the plans to log the watershed, my guess was, and my background would suggest that there must have been extensive biological surveys which have been done before we go and do harvesting in, in a, a sensitive, increasingly rare ecosystem. And when I discussed my presumption with knowledgeable colleagues and I checked uh, with publicly available data, I found that I was in fact very wrong. Uh, so that didn't seem very satisfactory. So a group of us started talking about uh, what tools are available to us to try and fill in some of these gaps, just from the perspective of an interested individual uh, uh, scientist and citizen science. So our thought was let's use available citizen science tools to document what is there before it's gone. Or perhaps more optimistically, if there is enough enlightened public pressure, uh, which flows from some of these uh, uh, humble investigations on what, what's uh, going on in this area, perhaps that might lead to longer term protection for the species which are in these environments and their habitats. So just to speak to the role of citizen science for a moment, um, this is really important. And I noticed there is a, a question in the chat box, you know, where is this information coming from that we can base conservation decisions on? And it seems that in many cases, citizen science really is critically important. It can be used simply to document uh, presence, absence sort of studies. And we see some interesting examples from BC provincial parks, which have got citizen scientists involved in doing some very interesting work in terms of uh, simply documenting what's in our uh, public parks, which is clearly interesting. But even going beyond that, now we're starting to see time series of information. And obviously in the bird world where there are things like Christmas bird counts and uh, events such as that, which have now a long-term history, we start to build pictures of population trends, again, using citizen science. And we can look uh, very recently from COSIWIG's May 21 press release, where the co-chair of the BIRD subcommittee comments citizen science observers across the continent are fundamentally important in determining population trends for this particular bird species and many others. We couldn't do our status assessments without them. So it is fundamentally important. So in the case of Ferry Creek, um, our view on what to do was to try and get uh, uh, the tool called iNaturalist. And really anyone can get involved in documenting uh, uh, biota using iNaturalist uploading photos with a smartphone or camera is straightforward is a great citizen science enabler. And indeed for us, we have 57 citizen scientists that have contributed observations to our project. Observations made using this sort of system because it also in includes uh, GPS coordinates if they are taken within that polygon are automatically assigned to our project area. And observations can be photographs, audio files, and evidence such as footprints and feathers. And I'll show you some of these examples later. And really best of all, these data are publicly available and can be used by anyone who wishes to investigate uh, what's occurring in their own backyard. So to continue on. So our project page within iNaturalist, you can set up a project. So we've established a project called Fairy Creek Research and our banner page features the iconic Pacific banana slug. Not exactly a rare species, I, I admit that this one happens to be a black morph in a particularly nice photograph. Our project is still at an early stage having uh, started in late May 
But with minimum survey effort, we've recorded 329 species from 948 observations. That's of October 27th, fairly up-to-date report. <clears throat> the project area, which we selected, is shown here. And we have a somewhat irregular polygon, which was drawn by eye to try and encompass uh, both the watershed and the upper camps with the presumption that with uh, the forest defenders occupying the various upper camps, we may get more eyes on the ground as it were. Now, because of access issues, which you've heard about um, both from the RCMP and also uh, the actual topography of the area is very, very steep. We haven't yet covered a lot of the watershed. So most of our observations are concentrated in Northern and Southern uh, limits of it. We hope to improve on that in the future. The sort of species we've seen are kind of summarized here in our uh, top 15 species. And we can see the Pacific banana slug at the top left leads the way. And interestingly, we see the Western toad, which is considered uh, by Kosi Lake as a special concern. Although I believe it is fairly common in BC, but nonetheless, uh, uh, throughout its range, it's, it's considered a special concern. And some of the other species ranging from things as uh, commonplace as ro American robin through to some very colorful and unusual specimens. I particularly like the one in the, the right of the on uh, the Northern Red Belt, which is not particularly uncommon, I believe, but nonetheless a very striking uh, fungus. So if we look at the distribution of what we've seen of those 319 species in the bottom left, that uh, uh, kind of donut-shaped plot shows the distribution of the, the animals we've seen so far. And uh, plants, fungi, birds are well represented in that breakdown to date. We've had a little bit of fun with the project too. We can have a, a case on the top left of a stoat, which seemed particularly determined to eat the sock of this observer at Helicamp. And we're able to capture a picture of that. And as I mentioned, uh, evidence such as footprints also count and someone turned in a uh, uh, evidence of uh, a black bear occurring in the bottom left. And the top right, we have a feather of uh, a band-tailed pigeon, which is uh, a species at risk, again, a special concern. And the idea of that feather was actually confirmed by a person who's a feather specialist from Rocky Point Bird Observatory. So to make the point that uh, by and large, these uh, observations, which I'm mentioning to you, uh, carry with it some uh, merit in terms of uh, verification of ID in, in cases, and usually with the identification confirmed with a second or third identifier. I think it was also mentioned we came across a very interesting uh, tail dropper slug uh, on the bottom right. And this is the reticulate tail dropper slug, which has the rather handy ability of dropping its tail when threatened, uh, thereby uh, confusing its would-be predator and leaving it with a partial meal before the rest of it escapes. So a useful, useful thing, I think. iNaturalist allows you to uh, summarize some of the uh, species at risk. Uh, some of the ones which we've seen include the Western Screech Owl, and Roy Royanne will speak to this in much more detail. We've already spoken about the band-tailed pigeon, the wonderful marble murlet. We'll hear more about that, I, I expect, from uh, Roy Ann. And uh, Jim spoke already about the peregrine falcon. Amongst the amphibians, we've seen Western toads, many records, and Northern red-legged frog. Our group has also made recordings of little brown bats near Fairy, La Fairy Lake. And this is work which uh, Lewis has uh, led. 
And this is the highest level of uh, endangered uh, in the Kosiglik scale of things. Um, I think BC is one of the last strong refuges for this particular species. And we have, a, I would argue, a special onus of responsibility given the, uh, the much depressed state of this particular species elsewhere in Canada. And we would stress that all this is with a, a very low a level search effort thus far. And we just prepared a report October 28th using the iNaturalist uh, uh, reporting features. And this is our vulnerable species we've seen thus far uh, sorted by number of occurrences. And Western toad is the one which pops up uh, most commonly in this particular watershed. But those are the, uh, the various species we've seen thus far. So we've been able to document many species, but in fact, they're really only the tip of the iceberg. In our own view, as we continue this work, we'd like to improve our spatial and seasonal coverage. As I mentioned already, we really focused on the northern and southern portions, and we haven't done too much in the middle. And in fact, our seasonal coverage is pretty poor too. So we're hoping to improve on that. And also within, uh, the watershed itself, there are habitats which are ripe for further work. For example, in the adjacent Renfrew Creek watershed, we have recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, picked up a single water sample and Lewis kindly uh, took it on to look at that using a simple light microscope and turned up uh, 32 microscopic aquatic species including the very interesting tardigrade called a water bear, which is well suited for survival in extreme environments. And uh, in fact, NASA has taken this into space and demonstrated it can survive short periods in a vacuum. So from experience in the nearby Carmana Walbrand area, we know that there are whole communi communities of uh, specialists epiphytes are living up in the forest canopy. And uh, the ancient forest alliance is a number of pictures of people doing amazing work uh, dangling from ropes as they study uh, what species occur in, in uh, that environment. I think it'd be great to document uh, those species for Barry Creek as well. So, it seems to me, and this is uh, just a thought as we reach a rather uh, critical point in the whole discussion of old growth in BC. Um, we realize, I think, that in BC, protection of biodiversity occurs at the convenience of the forest industry. The Forest and Range Practices Act prohibits the province from protecting wildlife and habitat if it interferes with the timber supply. And you can see that for yourself in the legislation. So practices such as this and other aspects of uh, forest management have resulted in BC receiving extremely poor grades from uh, EcoJustice, which is an ENGO specializing in legal affairs and protecting the environment where they reviewed the performances of province and territories in protecting Canada's biodiversity, which you can see in the graphic on the right. Now, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we heard that BC has announced new legislation, which updates this uh, particular act. And in fact, some of the updates seem quite positive and include more uh, public and First Nation involvement in decision-making. However, most problematically, from the perspective of protection of biodiversity, language which was in the previous version of FERPA, as it's known, which prioritizes timber, timber supply over species at risk, remains in the legislation, which is yet to be passed. It's not yet law. So I think that brings me to my final point, with regards to this, is a great time to get involved. 
I think an eco-justice lawyer gave good advice when he wrote to me and noted, while there's no formal process for receiving comments on a proposed bill, once it's actually introduced in the legislature, it's still worthwhile sending comments to your MLA or connecting with opposition parties to see if they plan to uh, uh, make comments. Media letters, letters to the editor, op-eds are also a great way to influence things for legislatures since politicians play close attention to media stories relevant to their work. So this is the point which is be made and uh, thank you for your attention. I think it is great if people would take this on and uh, try and influence things because I think we're at a turning point. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, John. Very interesting. Excellent. If you can just stop sharing your screen and we will introduce Royanne Petrel. <coughs> And Royanne is a UBC professor emeritus and avid birder. Her work in aquacultural engineering has contributed to the development of sustainable aquaculture and fisheries practices and the protection of wild aquatic species. Uh, she will now talk about the species of birds observed and documented in the Fairy Creek watershed. Welcome, Royanne. Hi, can everyone see the screen? Looks great. And you, and you can hear me? Yes. That's good. Sounds great. Looks great. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity today to speak about the threatened marble merlets of the Fairy Creek blockade, and in particular, the role of the citizen scientists, who I happen to be very proud of. I was asked um, to bring up some interesting characteristics of the marble merlets before I went into anything in depth. I just wanted to say that I was never very impressed with them until I started really having to survey them this summer. I don't know, I just thought they looked like a flying penguin, but they're much more than that. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're noted for how fast they can fly. They're super fast flyers. They fly up streams, up from the ocean into streams, uh, up streams into forests to nest. And depending on your, whatever measuring unit you use, US they say it's 50 miles and here we say 50 kilometers. <laughs> Some uh, biologists think these dove sized seabirds nest only in old growth forests because the widely spaced trees make for easier flying at high speeds. And they also think they um, fly so quickly as a form of predator avoidance. They're solitary birds. And at most in the ocean, you might see a pair. And, they are, and they're noted to uh, mate for life. Now, I've also asked you to try to imagine these birds, what they do is they actually crash land into their nest. They're great ocean swimmers and flyers, but when they get into terrestrial settings, well, they do what they can. And matter of fact, if they were to fall to the floor, they wouldn't be able to get up and fly because their legs just are not made for walking on land. So the, they're, they're loaded, they have a huge amount of body fat and their mossy nest really helps push in that impact as they hit. The nest is high, very high up, and far away from other marble merlets nests. Again, the distance, sometimes I, I read that it's up to 0.8 kilometers away from different nests. And again, they say this is a form of predator avoidance. So if you want to have a good habitat, you need to have a very large forest in order to accommodate even a few number of birds. It's against the law to destroy a nest housing a baby bird. So, uh, but unfortunately, the baby marble merlets are often killed as it's nearly impossible to find their nest during the logging operations. The picture on the left here is uh, 
I think it was one of the original 1975 or 74 images of when they first found a Marlboro Merlis nest. Uh, and they were shocked to find a co uh, coast uh, seabird nesting in a terrestrial setting. And it wasn't only until the 1970s that they actually found this bird. So many of their population was destroyed before they found it out because a lot of the first trees that were harvested were along the coast. So this is the effort you need to take to get up there. Our birding group has tried many times to find a nest and we have always failed. The trees are too big, too tall, and that is really what they like. They only have one, they only have one egg and there it is sitting there. Uh, this one's hatched and it's just, they don't make a nest, they just kind of make a hollow in some moss. And the other interesting point here is this little bird here on the left, um, is about ready to fledge. The parents have left them. It's up to, up to this bird to figure out how to fly through the forest, down the stream and get to the ocean on its own. This is a, a study from uh, around 2018 and this map here is from 2018. 20 to 24% of the potential marbled merbolet nesting habitat was lost between 1978 and 2008. And of course, and this is Fairy Creek down here and the marble merlet uh, habitat extends from Northern California up to mid uh, Alaska or even mid and higher. But it's still very, very good around here in this area. This is study is still 2008. It's obviously not really be as good now, but this green area would be uh, Carmarna Walbrand and Ferry Creek is right there. And the Ferry Creek watershed and the surrounding area is still considered to be really pristine, great marble merlet habitat. Um, although a lot of it has been lost, especially uh, since massive industrial scale logging occurred in Port Renfrew around 1924, um, all that is second growth and none of that around the port itself, or even around Ferry Lake would be considered good habitat. So the birds will have to fly up quite a ways up the rivers. Concern over the loss of the nesting habitat in coastal BC led to assessment of threatened by the Committee on Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada in 2000. And that's the status that John Nielsen, uh, the committee that John Nielsen was involved with. In the US, they have an Endangered Species Act and they take a more serious view. And they say, as long as a stand or watershed is still being used by a murrelet, mur it's important to the population and they will protect it. And now uh, more recently, they were now saying that even historically had been used by a marble merlet, it will be considered important. And they're having some uh, big fights between environmentalists and foresters in the US about preserving their habitat. They only have 24,000 birds left and we have somewhere between 50 and 95,000 uh, birds and, and left in BC and or maybe fewer after after what, what we've been witnessing in Ferry Creek. British Columbia, as been, been mentioned previously, does not require wildlife surveys ahead of logging large tracts. Now, if you were to log and to make a subdivision or log to uh, put in a mall or a parking lot, yes, you would have to under, undergo an environmental assessment, but forestry has, uh, there's a loophole in the Forestry Act that says they don't have to undergo an environmental assessment. Our bird group thought that to be quite odd. We met via social media to document the threatened marble merlets in three nesting areas associated with the Fairy Creek old growth blockade. These three areas are the unprotected old growth yellow cedar and hemlock cloud forest, which is on the end of Granite Main and top of Granite Creek in, in early July. That would be where Granite, Maine is where the Ferry Creek old growth blockade had its headquarters and also where River Camp was located and where this particular part uh, place is, is where they refer to as Heli Camp. Unprot and the other area is unprotected old growth coastal red cedar and hemlock forest in the central Walbrand 
and the other one, the final one, is unprotected old growth forest in the Bugaboo. The Bugaboo extends from, you can go from uh, Lonely Doug all the way to uh, come out of Walbrand almost through this forestry road. And this particular spot is somewhere in between. So what did we find? We found significant a number of birds were heard flying into and out of the forest during the breeding season. In the upper Granite Creek, we had three days of observations. We had to wake up at 3.30 in the morning. The protocol states that you have to uh, be counting birds one hour before dawn and about, I think, up to an hour afterwards. So we have to be out there. We had different ways of listening and recording. You have to listen because if they fly so fast, you really can't see them. <laughs> I'll show you a, a, a video of that coming up. We also had radar confirmation done by, uh, paid for by the Sierra Club and Western Wilderness Committee about 11 days later. Unfortunately, this forest is currently being logged. The bugaboo, we had calls of 75 birds uh, entering and leaving a new logging road construction site. Uh, the surveying occurred only one day as the road was closed at one end and was blocked by a ditch by the logging company at the other end. So it's really important to have more than one day of surveying, but in this particular case, we were not able to do that. Much of the forest was logged during the process. So this is drone footage. This is right behind in here is, is a Granite Creek and this forest here. We, our listening stations are above. So this is actually going down towards Ferry Creek. We would be listening here. At the time when we did this study, there had already been some clear cuts. On this side or the other side of the road, the, the clear cut wasn't as major and the forest starts just, just right above there. So this is in September. They cleared down almost all the rest of the trees along the side of the creek now, and which would force the birds to fly over a clear cut into the, to get into the upper forest. Now, remember, they don't really like that because it's predator avoidance. And it could be that they will not go here anymore because of that. This is a picture of the bugaboo. And the bugaboo, there's four birds that will be flying across the screen. I don't know if you can get my, here we go, flying like this. Calling, kerr, 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 kerr. But it sounds like a seabird. And this is in slow motion. I've seen this, I don't know how many times, and I've only seen the birds 20% of the time. So don't feel bad if you don't see them. This, this slide I just received yesterday from one of our birders. Uh, basically, this is Ferry Creek here. This is September 1st, 2021. This is October 31st, two months later. This is Ferry Creek watershed like John showed you. This is where this, the, the, the ovals are really where we had our listening stations. This right here is Granite Creek. So it comes up and ends about right there. Granite Creek coming up over here. Uh, as of September, this was with a clear cut. The birds came up, went over the clear cut and went over here and got into the forest. Or they went up to the creek and went up into here. According to the radar, some birds went in here, but the vast majority of the birds we found, 115, were nesting right into here. Some may have been in here, but the ones we heard and picked up would have been here. Now, as of now, the upper forest is gone and the plan is to cut all the rest of this before the snow falls. So basically, there will be no more nesting habitat for these marble merlets. And this is why the population has been decreasing so drastically due to forestry practices. This is the role building in the Bugaboo. The birds would have been flying up into here Possibly some of them would have been nesting in some of these trees. 
Since there's no creek in the vicinity, it's more than likely this was a nesting location. The trees are very tall, as you can see, as a requirement, and, and the spacing is far enough apart so they can fly at their high speed through the woods. In the wall brand, we had two days of observations. Again, um, one hour before dawn, and we got 56 to 76 birds, depending on the listening station and or device in the undeferred section of the central wall brand. As you recall, some of the wall, central wall brand was deferred. Uh, however, on this particular section, undeferred, we found more birds and we found only 35 birds in the deferred section along Wall Brand Creek. The two cut block, two old growth cut blocks have been slated for logging. We are uncertain at this time if they have been cut yet. When we were there, they had not been cut. Access to the wall brand is very difficult due to the security gates put up by the forestry companies to keep you out of Cape Coos and other areas up there uh, or there's other old growth forests. That makes us as citizen scientists, it's very difficult for us to be able to carry out these surveys. We had to drive an additional three hours on very difficult roads in order to carry them out, which is why we couldn't go until August. And it would have been nice because I also look for owls to have seen the owls in April, but there was lots of gates. And so we would not have been able to get through. This is a center wall brand. This is the wall brand Creek. And as before, these are old growth trees that are left along the creeks. The birds would be flying up here. Our listening station was here. The birds fly over here above our, over our heads and into the forest behind us. And why as some will, will continue on down the creek until they find a suitable nesting. The area behind here is unprotected old growth forest and it will be slated for logging. Many of those birds are still nesting there. And I don't know how much longer before that will be all cut down because it has not been listed as the deferred forest. We have been giving data to the government agencies. I've been giving them data since April. We never get any comment back from the federal government. Although the marble merlet is a federally listed migratory bird, the government stays away from problems if they occur on provincial crown lands. There's been only three cases in which the federal government has intervened on provincial crown lands in Canada. We also have spoken to various, uh, given the data to uh, and notify various provincial departments the BC Conservation Data Center, which is responsible for species assessment and conservation suggestions, uh, their website states that they use international standards for determining if an observation is an element or occurrence, or really that means a significant breeding population. If so, the element occurrences are indicated on maps available on their website. If you were to look at their website, however, you will see there are no element occurrence of any species, except maybe fish on some of their maps. This is, this, and this is when the case too, uh, when I looked, I couldn't find any occurrence of actual on the ground surveillance of marble merlets in the area. This is the, before we did their survey. This is the standard for breeding that they use. And it's, there's a, you can see it's a website called Nature Sense Explorer. They look for evidence of breeding, which includes historical and potential reoccurring breeding at a given location, which really means a reliable observation of one or more apparent breeding individuals flying into appropriate habitat during the breeding season. When I started this, I spoke to three experts. Uh, or when we had the data, I spoke to three experts. Well, how good is 75 to 115 birds going into a habitat? Is it enough? All three said 25 is enough, especially if they're circulating and flying in. So we had 75 to 115, and the two experts that were in the United States thought it was highly significant numbers, seeing that they don't have those kind of numbers very often anymore. The Marlboro Merlet will be reassessed by the Canadian, uh, this conservation data center this fall. Um, so, but the date, the, 
we assess this fall, but we won't have any information about the assessment until next spring. I was hoping that, you know, we would have some information. However, they're not going to use our map. Our data will not be mapped. And I said, why? It's significant. Experts say it's significant. You say it's significant. Everyone says it's significant. How come it won't be on your maps? And the reason for that is they have no resources. BC now has over 2000 species at risk and they can't map them all and they don't even know where to start. And they have a very small department. And when they told me this, I can almost hear the crying on the, on the email. I, I never thought an email message could cry, but it was crying. However, they were very appreciative of what we were doing. And they said, thanks for reaching out. Your submissions are important and appreciated, even if they don't end up being mapped this round, they are still used by us for assessment. We also um, have given our data to ecosystem information section, knowledge management branch of BC Ministry of Environment. There, uh, we've been, our data has been started putting it up in August. I have screech owl data there as well and other birds uh, and we're just going to learn how to up, update uh, plant uh, data as well, which is much more complicated. But our data will be available to the public and to other ministries using something called IMAPBC. And you'll be able to go on there, create your map, touch on uh, bird species, look for seabirds, look for marble merlets, and our marble merlet data will be mapped even though the forest will not be there. <laughs> our group has just been given their own Excel template, ID and password. So that our future submissions will be easier to file and review and hopefully be available to the public quicker. We also submitted the data to BC Ministry of Forest. They had no comment other than to suggest we provide our data to the conservation data center. The Conservation Data Center said the Ministry of Forest does not have to follow their conservation protection suggestions. So basically, we have, a, we have the CDC we're paying, are using our tax money to support, but no one's paying any attention to them. So summary in our future work, the threatened marble merlet depends on coastal old growth forests, very clear, the forestry is leading cause of its continued population decline, and it will continue to decline uh, as we have very few coastal forests left, and they are at this moment cutting down prime ones at Ferry Creek. Wildlife sur surveys should be carried out ahead of logging the remaining old growth forests. We need to know, and Dr. Nielsen spoke about it, everyone else has spoke about it ahead, how important this is. We have to demand this, and um, this should happen overnight. Just, it's crazy that you know, we should have an F, you know, grade for wildlife. Citizen scientists provide necessary government to government agencies. And I want you to know that people came to me uh, through Facebook, everything saying, I can help. I'll do anything. A lot of people just learned how to bird. They were there. They were helpful. We had received training. We did it. Um, you have to kind of like early mornings and camping out and the terrible weather, but it's otherwise we had fun. The old growth habitat of the threatened species like the marble merlet, western screech owl, and the speckled belly lichen should be protected. The speckled belly lichen will be, Tasa will be speaking about it next. The western screech owl, I will be talking about on a presentation at Comox United Church on November 15th at 7 p.m. So, and John will also be speaking more about iNaturalists at this time. Um, it's, there, we have discovered many of them there uh, and they're highly threatened, uh, but they seem to have a, a small habitat left there. And it would be great and wonderful if we could protect that. In the case of the Upper Granite Main and Creek, Helicamp, what we, we call all three of these species reside or nest there and now their habitat is being logged, gone forever. There's a lot of information here. I'm leaving you some reference materials that you could probably copy or get down. One that was really, really good is meet the endangered bird that nests high above Ferry Creek. 
uh, Capital Daily, July 4th. It's a wonderful article, tells you everything you ever wanted to know about the Marble Merlet and the politics behind it, and even US and everything else, but we just don't have time for it today. Uh, and there's some other articles to do, uh, the so-called recovery plan. There's very, very few protected areas, protected being parks in which it will not be logged. Uh, near at Ferry Creek, there's something called a wildlife habitat area, which is inside the watershed, but that does not give protection against logging. Um, and it, we don't even know at this point in time whether there's marble merlets nesting in there, but we do know they were nesting outside of it and that forest is being logged. And that's all I have to say. Wonderful, thank you, Royanne. That's amazing work you're doing, you and the citizen scientists. <clears throat> and actually one of our audience members was wondering, is it, would you say it's mostly citizen science scientists that are collecting this data rather than That's scientists right. or government, yeah. Well, the um, once uh, on the Western Screech Owl, when I found it in Kekus, they had never been a Western Screech Owl identified anywhere because there's never been any surveys in the whole blockade area. And I went down and I found one and it gone on television in the media. Uh, then biologists went there but they only went to the spot where I found the owl. They didn't carry out a bigger, wider survey. And the government, the, and for that particular case, the wildlife biologist in the forest, BC Forestry said, oh, the logging company shouldn't log there. And then they changed their mind because their habitat was already logged in March. So three months ahead, they already logged it. So. Basically, whatever they're nesting in is a very small section right along the uh, Kekus River. So that's, that's pretty much the state. If we don't have sentiment sciences, so if we don't have people talking about what we need, their laws are not changed. And that is what I heard is the yes, historical fact. Hmm. Sorry for that. No, so <laughs> sad. But uh, another question someone had was, if these species were found on federal land, then would there is there federal legislation that would protect them? Not much better. I mean, there's the laws, but again, the federal looks at saving the nest, an active nest. So uh, oh really, how are you going to find that in a marble merlet? You can't find it in a screech owl either. I mean, we found 18 screech owls and we haven't found a single nest. And we wouldn't even bother looking for them. And you, you probably kill yourself falling down a mountain if you try to find a nest. So no, uh, the laws have to be changed or to be more similar to what they are in the United States where they have an Endangered Species Act that looks at pairs, mating pairs and surveys done ahead of any development. Um, in that particular case, we're not saying that you have to, you can't log the whole forest, of course you can but you're going to know what habitat is being used and where. Uh, it's like the marble merlets. Don't mind if there's some empty spots in a forest. It makes it easier for them to fly up. It just can't be a clear cut. You see what I mean? Hmm. Um, someone was wondering what time of the year do the marble merlets nest? Uh, well, June, uh, we went out June. We went out late June, but it was a little early. I think they were trying to find their nest then then all of July and August. And then we just had in the beginning, of, Carolyn's online, she's a birder. I can't remember whether it was late September or beginning October, a re-nesting occurred in Helicamp. So even though they were cutting down the forest, a uh, marble merlets, they hadn't, maybe they had lost their, their eggs the first time around. Uh, we went down and re-nested because we got them on record again. So they oh. will re-nest. So they're, they're still trying to get their baby out as we speak. Oh, interesting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, wonderful, Royan. Thank you so very, very much. Um, maybe just one more question for uh, Dr. Nielsen. Um, someone was wondering if anybody uses the iNatural, anyone uh, involved in the iNaturalist project at Ferry Creek, if they were documenting scat of various species. Is that an important set of data? Uh, I think any sort of evidence would be wonderful. And uh, as long as we could identify SCAT uh, uh, well, that uh, certainly would be legitimate evidence um, and, and could be used. 
Um, I, I just want to speak to an earlier question, Phil. Someone was interested about the federal laws and how they apply in BC. Um, the federal law of interest is called SARA, uh, Species at Risk Act. And uh, that the way that works is it only applies in federal lands, such as uh, national parks, uh, DND lands, those sorts of things. But uh, you can see a, a distinct difference in the approach. Uh, within a national park, such as Pacific Rim, they're putting in a bikeway between Tofino and Euclid. And there's been some identified rare uh, uh, slugs, in fact, a tail dropper species, or sorry, I think it's called the Pacific Tromedary Jumping Slug. And Parks Canada is going to great lengths to uh, avoid sensitive habitat for this particular slug as it puts in this uh, wonderful bikeway between those two centers. So I, I, I'd love to see a bit more attention in uh, provincial, provincially regulated ground lands uh, to protect our species like that. It really is true that before we do anything like bike lanes, roads, logging, we've got to understand the ecology of an area better um, mm -hmm. before we make a move. Isn't that true? So thank, right. thank you all of you for the work you're doing and for sharing your work tonight. Thank you so much. And for everyone attending, thank you. Um, if everyone could take a very short moment and fill out the survey link I've just put into the chat, if you can click on that live link and it's just five quick questions just to let us know uh, what you thought about the presentation tonight. Um, and thank you, thank you again, all of you. Thank you, that was terrific, super interesting and very inspiring. Good night. Thank you, good night. Thank you.